What, sort of a, a little bit of a follow-up on that, it, it, not in the pure resistance setting, but in the patient that may be platinum sensitive, or potentially platinum sensitive, the concept of potentially delaying use of platinum to make the, to allow the more platinum sensitive clones to be present or the platinum sensitive clone to be present and have more platinum sensitivity. Is there any, any support for that? You know, sort of delaying platinum in that setting, not pure resistance, but making it more sensitive? Well, I think historical studies have demonstrated th this, and we certainly see patients in our practice all the time that have um, come back around to platinum-containing regimens um, who um, were in the partially platinum-sensitive zone. If, I think mostly this is in patients who were treated with non-platinum regimens who had, um, had initial progression-free intervals of less than 12 months and greater than six months that have demonstrated benefit of retreatment that seem to be um, with outcomes more favorable than what would have been predicted. So I would say that that's sort of an expression of uh, clones that are, are platinum uh, sensitive. We unfortunately don't hit the stem cells, which is I think going to be the rate limiting step in all of these patients, but I think we, see, we do recycle platinum containing regimens in those that would have been thought to have not to have benefit. Do you have any comments or questions? Experience with this phenomenon? No, I mean, like you said, a lot of it's historically based, but I mean, I would, I would largely agree with everything that you said. So, so, uh, so, 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 so what we concluded was that there is no such thing as prolonging the, artificially prolonging the platinum free interval that was a popular concept back in the late 90s? Well, there's no level one evidence at this point. Yeah, um, I mean, the study that was always cited for that actually doesn't show that. And back in the mid to late 90s, it was a taxotere, docetaxel study. Um, and I'm not aware of any data that uh, support that to any significant degree at all. In my conclusion would be if, if, if you think it's appropriate to give platinum and, it, and the patient can tolerate it, right. then you give it. Um, and hopefully you get a good response. Obviously, if a patient can't receive it because of toxicities, then you don't give it. But artificially prolonging it, uh, I don't think we have evidence to support that's better. So let's return to the, to the question of bevacizumab again. We talked about it a little bit, in, uh, actually in some detail in the frontline setting. What about in the second line setting? Obviously, two populations. One would be the potentially platinum sensitive recurrence and then also the platinum resistant. So Warner, what is, what is, your, what is your take on that? How would you, you approach know, it? You know, to kind of echo what Tate had said earlier, we, you know, we liberally use bevacizumab in the platinum resistance setting, week, specifically using weekly taxol with bevacizumab based on the Aurelia trial. And, um, you know, we've actually seen some pretty substantial clinical responses to that. And then similarly, in, in the platinum sensitive setting, we also use it in combination with gemcitabine and caroplatin. And uh, again, so we use it quite liberally and, you know, for us, um, you know, the, the big question we already talked about this is when you stop the bevacizumab and, you know, in our experience, you know, we, it's a really a fairly small fraction of women that go on it indefinitely. Usually most women wind up progressing or they wind up having toxicity related to the bevacizumab. So they wind up ultimately declaring themselves. But we do use the drug quite liberally in both the, the platinum sensitive and resistant setting. Any other? Comments about yeah, I, I would say that we use um, we use the oceans equivalent quite frequently, and um, you know I think the really study is actually a fascinating study. So we, we will actually combine it with uh, doxel, topo a little bit less, um, but the subset analysis for the weekly taxol with Bev showing a PFS of 11 months and overall survival to 22 months. Now I recognize it's a subset analysis, but there's something about that combination I think that suggests there's a synergism. In fact, if you go back to GOG 262, I was a little surprised that that one arm actually didn't do better uh, because of that, of the Aurelia data. But it may be that platinum resistant disease is biologically different and that combination is particularly effective. Well, also, you don't, I think the other issue is that uh, you don't see the overwhelming positive effect of platinum because that's obviously yeah. one of the issues. Platinum is so overwhelmingly important yeah, it to be able to look at that subset. If you eliminate that, uh, it, it may be a lot easier. So that, that may be present in the front line, you just can't see it. Well, there, well, there was one other thing too. That, uh, the Aurelia trial was not a comparison of weekly taxol versus every three week taxol. It may well be that every three week taxol bevacizumab would give you the same results in a taxane naive uh, patient at that point. 
And the only other comment I'd make about that study is, is uh, the earlier study was the, is the really very unfavorable impact on quality of life and particularly abdominal pain. I mean, to uh, be able to demonstrate, uh, it, it's hard. It's been hard in studies to be able to show a, a, a real impact uh, on a, a clinically relevant quality of life issue. And that study really showed it very clearly, which was uh, obviously very important for our patients. Um, two other brief questions uh, to, to address sort of in the surgical realm is the, because it comes up, certainly I hear about it uh, often, and, and uh, is what is the role of hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy in uh, specifically in the second line resistance setting in ovarian cancer? Comments, Bob? I think that the role is purely investigational, and I, I mean that we have no randomized controlled trial data, even in non-gynecologic malignancies. Um, I think that they're based on, you know, comparing populations undergoing um, high PEC in the setting of principally mucinous tumors, uh, appendiceal uh, tumors, colonic tumors. Uh, with intraperitoneal dissemination, comparing their outcomes to historical controls. So I don't really think that we can apply this without careful investigation. I think maybe the only exception to that that should be considered are in the mucinous tumors that are um, generally refractory to standard management. No, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it, from our perspective, it's entirely investigational, but it's not just high pick. It's got to be done in combination with doing pretty extensive perinatectomies. So there's a linkage not just to the high pig, but doing a pretty substantial debulking type surgery. And uh, I mean, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. I think it's, you know, it's something that should be done on, uh, preferably on a research protocol. Yeah, and the mortality, morbidity of that procedure right. in certain centers is exceedingly high. We worry about that. Yeah, the toxicity is such that you've got, I think you've got to have definite proof that it works before you start uh, using that outside of a trial. And the, and the final surgical question, which again is a very important uh, issue that is actually being addressed in clinical trials, we don't have data, is the role of secondary surgical cytoreduction. Want to comment about that? Well, as you all know, there's an ongoing GOG trial to answer this question, but there is a subset of women who have re uh, recurrences that are normally well out from their initial therapy. They're normally isolated, and those patients do benefit from a surgical resection. Um, it doesn't obviate the need of chemotherapy on the back end, uh, but there's a small percentage of women that actually have an isolated mass that we can resect. The tricky part is how to identify those women. And so, you know, we do, they go through a fair amount of imaging to make sure that they have an isolated mass. And even surgically, we try to evaluate them and not put them through a fairly large morbid procedure trying to answer that question. So, you know, oftentimes we'll start their case laparoscopically, if there's no peritoneal disease, then we'll go on and do this, the uh, secondary side reduction. 